the book of 1 Samuel, so if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn there. Old Testament, <clears throat> Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, which we just finished, and then Ruth, which we will not look at, great little story in between, but same time frame, and then we start 1 Samuel. So it is another Old Testament book. Yes, I'm bucking the trend. I'm teaching the Old Testament, even though there are those out there that say, why? Why do you teach the Old Testament? Not to me personally, but why do churches teach the Old Testament? It's old. It's boring. It's, it happened so many years ago. But you know, contrary to popular opinion, men and women, the Old Testament to me is an amazing book. It's an amazing set of books. There's 39 books collectively that make up the Old Testament. And you know what, the, the reason why I think the Old Testament has so much to offer is because the reality is it's full of something that people today pay a whole lot of money for. They go and they pay money on the big screen, on the small screen, they pay money to buy books in print or on their Kindles, because all of what I'm talking about, what we pay money to go see is called story. It's called movies, it's called parable or some sort of idea of narrative. And so what we talk about when we're looking at the Old Testament is it's full of story. It's full of something that grabs our attention. And so if you're familiar with stories at all, maybe you used to have your mom or your dad read to you a bedtime story or maybe moms and dads, you read your children bedtime story now and oftentimes they start off with once upon a time, right, in a land Far, far away, right? And then in those stories, there's always usually the same kinds of things. There's, there's antagonists. There, there's someone that's there that's bad, that's causing a problem, because otherwise everything would be good, and it's not as interesting if everything was good. There are protagonists in a story, which those are the good guys. And so the protagonists are against the antagonists. And then you have the tension, especially in romance movies or novels or stories, right? Couple meets each other, everything's great, then something happens, tension. And then they split apart, and guess what happens at the end? They come back together. But it always has generally tension in it. You've got protagonists, antagonists, you've got the tension. You've got all of those things that cause us to get involved. And sometimes these stories even end with, and they lived happily ever after. Not always, just watched a movie that ended horribly. Um, which always throws you for your loop. But the reality is the Old Testament is full of story. And you know what? I love it because we've already looked at Israel, and we're long past, at least in terms of where we're at in 1 Samuel, we're long past the beginning of the Israelites, if you know your Bible. You, if you're reading right now through the Bible, we're on, what, day 14, day 13? No, you can't help me, Siri. Beat it. So we're, we're reading through this stuff. And we've read through much of Genesis, Genesis chapters, I think we're at like chapter 29 if you're reading through the Bible with us, um, in your own. And the truth is, we've already seen Abraham and his call of God and how God said Abraham would be the, the father of many nations, right? And he would have a son. We've seen his story. And then after Abraham, it was Ishmael. No, he was not the promised son. Instead, Isaac was the promised son, Yeah. And we saw Isaac's story, and then we know about his son Jacob, at least the one that the line goes through. After Jacob, of course, came Joseph, and this is all in the book of Genesis. And Joseph, in, the prom or in, in Egypt rather, Joseph was there, and he was sent by God to prepare um, the sustenance for God's people. And so Joseph is in Egypt, and then all the people come, his whole family comes, and suddenly for 400 years the Israelites are in Egypt, and then suddenly they're slaves, and God says to somebody, I want you to go, and I want you to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And who are we talking about now? Moses. And Moses, he goes, goes and he does all that God's asked him to do with, with Pharaoh, and they leave in the Exodus, and that's what the book of Exodus is all about. And then as they're wandering the desert for a couple of years. 40, right? Round and round, one lap after another. Sin, sin, sin. Lap, lap, lap. Sin, sin, sin. Sounds like a dog, right? The reality is, then finally, Moses is done. He sees the promised land, and then God raises up 
Joshua, right? To take them into the promised land. And that's the whole book of Joshua. And they go and they take the promised land, some of it, part of it. But ultimately, the Israelites are a, a, a loosely knit group of tribes. They're not a succinct group of people. They're not centered around a succinct thing, at least not by how they live. They should be. But the reality is they were all over the place worshiping other gods. And that's where it is we looked at the book of Judges and how it was that God raised up these judges. Not magistrate, gavel, you know, judge, but instead savior, deliverer, point people back to God, judge. But the challenge was with that whole thing was <clears throat> instead of leading people to God, oftentimes these judges, unfortunately, because their own lives were such, they led people away from God. And so we come to the book of 1 Samuel. And I want you to know, as we're in 1 Samuel, as much as it was in the book of Judges, because it's right on the heels of Judges, it's still one of the darkest histories in the nation of Israel, one of the darkest times in the nation of Israel, spiritually. These folks were corrupt in how they lived. And the reality is, God was going to raise up these judges to save them. And unfortunately, as we saw, each judge, starting with Othniel, all the way down to Samson, Samson being the worst, led people not towards God. He himself struggled so much in his own walk with the Lord. He struggled to obey. He struggled with his lust for women. He struggled with many things in life. And so we're at a point where we look and say, well, what's God going to do now? I mean, I just gave you a quick uh, history of the Israelites, of the Hebrew people. What's God going to do now? Because his people failed to return to him. They would come to him and then they would leave. They would come to him and they would leave. They would come to him and they would leave. Does it sound like anybody's life today? How it is sometimes Christians struggle. They want to live for the Lord. This was my life all growing up. Before at 20 years of age, I finally said, that's it. I'm giving God everything. Because I always wanted to do right and then I would go off and do wrong. I wanted to do right and then I would go off and do wrong. You know what the reality is? That's right where these people are at. It was such a dark time that Judges 17.6 tells us, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. Everyone did as he saw fit. Does that sound like our postmodern world today? That's exactly where we're at today, men and women. What's right for you is right for you, but what's right for me is right for me. You do you and I'll do me, right? You live your life, I'll live mine, we're all okay. Don't tell anybody how to live their life. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And you know, not only were the people wicked in so many ways, but the leadership was perverse as well, as we're going to see very quickly. And it was obvious, even as the writer of Judges says this, Judge 17.6, in those days Israel had no king, everyone did as he saw fit. It was obvious the author of Judges, he thought the nation was headed for total disaster unless God provided a righteous king to lead the people. And so we come to 1 Samuel. And this is a historical book that contains some of the greatest stories that you'll ever read in all of the Bible. And these are the stories of real people in real situations. Because in 1 Samuel, there are battle stories. There's the telling of Israel's ongoing campaign to seek and ensure independence from external powers. There's internal fights to overcome struggles of pride, fear, and jealousy. There's family stories in 1 Samuel, stories of birth, stories of a marriage, stories of death, of love and hate, of rivalry, of violence and rape, of friendship and loyalty. There are stories that center on women. There are stories that center on men, <laughs> on children, on young people, and even the aged, right? Yes, all of it. There are stories from small towns, and there are stories from the countryside as well. Amazing stories. And you know what? I want you to know through it all, these stories, though they're about people's lives, we can see ourselves in them. Ultimately, this is a story about God the God of all creation, and how the God of all creation is working things out for our good and for his glory, how God uses people to accomplish his purposes and means. 
All of that is threaded throughout. And I want you to realize, because there are some who say the Old Testament, and for that matter, the New Testament to a certain degree, is just a collection of stories that people put together. You know, some, some sort of um, editor just started to grab different stories. But if you follow along with what I just said, and if you read through the Bible, what you'll see is God is very intentional, the Holy Spirit, in causing people to write And the lives that the Bible includes, they are leading us towards something. Do you realize that? They are taking us in a direction. And I said this several weeks ago. We finished the book of Judges by looking at how it is that all of the Bible is about Jesus. All of the Bible is a story, a thread that contains the Messiah. And how ultimately all the Bible points to the lordship of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has purpose. So we get into 1 Samuel. You got Bibles, chapter 1. As we start this book, there's no preliminary <laughs> there's no preliminary discussion or introduction. Instead, we're plunged straight into a family story. And it starts with the story of a man named Elkanah. That's a strong name, Elkanah. And his two wives, Hannah and Penaniah, or Penina. Let's, let's, call it, let's call her Penny, right? Okay? Penina. Verse 1, let's read it. There was a certain man from Ramathame, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, and here's the sons of. He was the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had None. So we start right away, introduced to these three characters, Elkanah, Hannah, and Penina. And this is their story, and it starts with the man named Elkanah. And break down all the son of, son of, son of, and what you'll find that this man was a Levite. And the Levites were the ones that served in the house of God. Now at this time in the history of Israel, the house of God was not a temple. The house of God was a tabernacle. It was a tent. And so they took this tent. If you remember, through the Exodus, they would take this tent all through the Israelite wanderings, and they would set up the tent, and then they would move when God, pillar by day, a fire by day, and a pillar of fire, or the uh, pillar of fire by night, and a cloud by day, excuse me. And they would follow that and then set up the tabernacle and then worship God. And that's where it was. Soon it would be, as we know under Solomon, it would be a grand house. It would be a grand temple full of gold and all of the things that it would possess. But at this time, it was not that. And the Levites, the ones who were responsible to take care of the temple, call them the the priests, if you will, they were scattered throughout the land at this time. And they would go up to Shiloh, where the tabernacle was, and they would minister at the temple or the tabernacle whenever they were needed. And this was a great honor. And so Elkanah was not just any man. Elkanah was a man who was of this line that got to serve in the house of God. And I can tell you from the very beginning, this guy is a lot like us. Not the fact that he has two wives. Don't don't misunderstand. That's not like us. That's one state over, okay? The, the, The truth is, what you'll find is, he is a lot like us in the fact that he struggles, in the fact that he makes mistakes. He fails at times to do the right thing. So apparently he was married to Hannah in the beginning, and Hannah proved to be barren. And so it says that he takes another wife, or we learn that he takes another wife, to carry on his family line. Now he wasn't the first guy to do this, and he wouldn't be the last. We know that Abraham, what did he do? He married Hagar, right? So he had two wives. We know that Jacob ended up with four wives. David had more than one wife. And Solomon, he had a couple, well, he had a thousand wives, right? And I want you to realize it wasn't God's original plan. When you read these things, you don't look at this and say, well, that's that's the the foundation I'm going to use to go to my wife and say I want another wife because it's in the Bible. Let me know how that works out for you. It's not going to go well, okay? And I don't think we'd want it anyway. Are you with me? Uh, How many wives say your husband's enough? You know, that's a challenge enough, it's a blessing enough, it's a struggle enough. How many husbands would say this? I don't need two of these or three of these. I don't know how Solomon did a thousand. That's absolutely nuts. But folks, we don't know why Elkanah 
didn't wait on the Lord. We don't know why he didn't trust him to work out his plan. Because what he'll find out is eventually God had a plan for Hannah, didn't he? God had a plan all along, and that's what this book is about. Now, Elkanah wasn't a bad man. He was an evil man. An evil man. In many ways, he seemed to be a good and a godly man. But he was just a person who struggled to trust the Lord and wait on him. Anybody relate to that at times? Anybody ever find yourself struggling to wait on God? Struggling to trust him? Now, I don't know about you, but at 47 years of age, I look back on my life and I've made a few mistakes. Quite a few, in fact, like all of us have. And I'm able to look at those and evaluate. And you know, oftentimes, the times that I made some of the most colossal mistakes in my life is when I wanted to move ahead and do something, and I thought that it was the right thing to do, and I was somewhat impetuous and somewhat impatient. And so I jumped ahead and ran ahead, and then ultimately, over time, because hindsight is, well, it's better vision. Yeah, it's 2020. The reality is I realized I should have waited on God. I should have trusted God for what was going on. I've learned that in my life. And one of my biggest prayers at 47 years of age is, Lord, help me to be patient. Help me to trust you when I don't see what I'm supposed to do. Help me to wait on you. If you're somebody who likes to move fast, if you're somebody who likes to make decisions quickly, if you're somebody who likes to get stuff done and you don't like to wait around, that's a lot of us. Anybody willing to raise your hand and say, that's you? <laughs> that's me? It's something I've had to learn. Something I am still learning is what it means to say, well, I know I want to get stuff done. I know I want to go this direction. I want to accomplish this. But, Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but, hey, I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to trust in you. Elkanah could have waited on the Lord because the Bible clearly states in the beginning God's intent was for one man and one woman for one marriage, for a lifetime. That's God's plan. That's God's will. Elkanah, like many others in the word, not because God told them to, but because of their own lack of trust, moved ahead. You think Abraham would have wished he could have said, okay, I'll wait on God with Sarah. Yeah, I'll bet in hindsight he wishes he could have done that. Now, God is sovereign, but the reality is, folks, learning to trust God is critical. And I want you to see what his lack of trusting God, the trouble that it caused his family. Look at verse 3. He's got these two wives. And it says, year after year, this man, Elkanah, went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where the tabernacle was. We're also, we're introduced to two new characters. It's going to be another family. We won't look at them much this week. Next week, we're going to look at this next family. It says, where Hophni... And Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. And whenever the day, or excuse me, whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. Now, that's critical. If you're a highlighter, an underliner, notice that. He would give some of that meat to his wife Penina and to all of her sons and and daughters, because between the two of them, they had many. But to Hannah, it says he gave a double portion, a better portion, a greater portion, because he loved her. Now, does it infer that he didn't love Penina? You know what? All we have is this. But it stresses that he loved Hannah, and it says the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival, read that, Penina, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival, Penina, provoked her till she wept and would not eat. In fact, it says Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? You know what? He seems like a nice guy, but he's really out to lunch right here. Plain and simple. Hey, look at what's going on, bud. You can come and try and say to your wife all you want, oh, what's the problem? You got me. Well, she's got you, but she's also got the other rival, and that rival is making her life a living hell. 
And that rival has many sons and daughters that she doesn't have, and that is rubbing salt in her proverbial wound. What's the problem? You got me? Yeah, I guess I got you half the time. But the reality is, folks, this was a difficult situation. And there are some who have gone through this difficult situation. Some who are going through, have always been in this difficult situation, where they can't have children. It's not an easy thing. You might have personally gone through this, or maybe you know someone who has. But I want you to see whether or not it's this particular situation or any other situation that brings difficulty to our lives. Because some of you in here this morning, you're single and you don't want to be. And you feel alone. You want your situation to change and you're asking, just as Hannah asked over and over, Lord, give me a child. You're asking, Lord, give me a husband. Lord, give me a wife. Lord, give me a job. Lord, give me. And all the things that we come to God that create difficult situations in our life, this would qualify as a difficult situation for Hannah. And read that for Elkanah, as much as he tried to avoid it and deny it. He still has to live in, under the roof with all of this turmoil, with the pain and the heartache. And you know what? I want you to hear this. The thing that matters most, especially as believers in Jesus Christ, is not whether or not we're going to go through difficulty, because the truth is we will. Do you know that to be the truth? In this life, Jesus says, you will have tribulation. You will have difficulty. It's not whether or not we have difficulty, but the truth is, and the most important thing we need to discover is, when we have that difficulty, what do we do with it? How do we respond to it? Where do we take that difficulty, and how do we try and anesthetize or assuage that difficulty or navigate that difficulty? We all want to get out of the difficulty. I've never met anybody that said, I'm in the midst of a, one of the most difficult situations I've ever been in, and I love it. I just want to stay here for months, a year even. It sounds like I have never met anybody. I, and Christians will say, well, it's, it's hard, and I'm learning to trust the Lord. I mean, I get that, and it's true. But the truth is, if we're all honest, we want to be out of difficulty as fast as we got into it. We don't like it. It's troubling. And the question we want to ask ourselves is, when it comes, how do we respond and where do we turn? Because I love what you see Hannah do. This, to me, is a challenge. Look at how Hannah responds and look where Hannah turns with this very real pain and heartache. Now, you need to know Hannah means woman of grace. So this woman is full of grace grace. She is a gracious individual. What I be, believe to be one of the most attractive features in any person, man or woman, when someone's gracious, when someone and that graciousness I think includes the ability to overlook wrongs when done to them. The ability not to want revenge when something's done to them and me. To be gracious is a beautiful characteristic. I pray that graciousness would grow in my life more and more. And I want you to see what this woman of grace, what she does, where she turns, and how she responds. Look at verse 9. Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. And here she goes. Woman, here she's going to roar. She is going to take over, and she is going to... No. It says, now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much. And read this, Hannah prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow to the Lord, saying, O Lord Almighty, I love it. There's the name that we were singing about, one of the names of God, one of the characteristics of God. Nothing is impossible with God. You are almighty. You can do anything. She says, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant. Notice what she calls herself. She is God's servant. She's not serving at the temple. But she sees herself as belonging to the Lord God Almighty. She says, if you not forget your servant, but give your servant, give her a son, speaking of herself, then I will give him to you. I'll give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. He would be that kind of person. So put yourself in Hannah's situation. Penina, 
was called her rival. Anybody want to sign up in a marriage to not just have a husband but a rival too? Let me just live with that 24 and 7. I would love to be able to daily wake up and there's my rival. I would daily like to have a rival for my husband's attention or women or if you're a man, a rival for your wife's attention. She was a rival for his love. He was a rival for his time. In fact, her very existence with all her sons and daughters only made it that much more painful because what she didn't have and what she couldn't provide Elkanah, because obviously it wasn't Elkanah's problem, was it? Elkanah was fertile. He could have children. Panina proved that. But this was all about where Hannah was at. And so all of that exacerbated, I think, her misery, as it says, her bitterness of soul and year after year it says I mean it's one thing to say yeah I've got a rival and she shows up every Christmas can't stand Christmas because man it's all about the rivalry between my my oh, it's once a year it's oh, okay it's Christmas and Easter it's whenever the family has to get together I mean that's that's one thing but it's year after year and read that it's day after day they lived under the same roof all of this misery and all of this pain And it says Penina would provoke her and irritate her. She wasn't a friend. She was somebody who continually had mean things to say, continually rubbed it in about who she was and how it was that she had children and Hannah didn't. In fact, she was unkind and rude. Anybody ever have someone like that in your family? Hopefully not. But there it is right for us to see we all can relate to the difficulty and how easy it would have been for Hannah to say this isn't fair I I, I strive to be a gracious woman serving the Lord and loving him I believe in him this isn't fair why is this rude mean provoking individual why does she have kids and I don't you ever look at this world and think why does that evil person why did he get the promotion why, why, why does she have so much money and I don't? I go to church, I serve, I give, and yet my cousin, she doesn't want anything to do with God, and they have all the money in the world. That doesn't seem right. What's up, God? It doesn't seem fair. This would have been right in her face every single day. Rude, mean, unkind, provoking, irritating, and yet she's got children all over the place, and Hannah had none out of her own mouth. Hannah confessed to the Lord that she was miserable. I'm miserable, God. And think of what she could have done and how she could have responded, probably what in her flesh she would have liked to have done, what many of us in similar situations in our flesh would like to do as well. We would like to ramp it up and get even, wouldn't we? If you're going to be mean to me, I'm going to be mean to you. That's our flesh. That's our sinfulness. You treat me this way, I'm going to treat you just as bad. In fact, we're going to see who can do worse. I mean, that is our human sinful nature. She could have responded in so many ways with like kind, doing unto others what was done unto her. But instead, it says she turns to the Lord. She turns to the Lord with her misery. We're not told that she turns to Elkanah on a daily basis and whines and complains and says, get rid of her, get rid of her family. You married me first. This isn't godly. She didn't go and she didn't make Elkanah's life worse. She could have. She didn't make Panina's wife worse. She could have, but instead in this difficult situation, I love how she turns to the Lord with her misery, with her bitterness of soul and probably with a whole lot of other emotions. And you know what? We know how it is so often people in difficult situations like this or many others, whether or not it's a short difficulty or if it's a year after year after year year difficulty, sometimes people turn to other things. Sometimes people allow other emotions instead of graciousness to explode. And sometimes people, even in the midst of this kind of situation, they don't turn to God, they turn away from God. I would love to tell you over the years of being a pastor that I've never heard of anybody blaming God for their difficulty, but the reality is it's not the case. Sometimes people in that situation, they blame God and say, why God? It's not fair, God. Why are you doing this, God? And and the truth is, folks, what I think was so beautiful about Hannah 
is how she turned to God in prayer and commitment and realizing all the years of pain, all of the difficulty, suffering, that no doubt shaped her into a woman of character and faith and motivated her to give her best to the Lord. Because like I said, she didn't express her anguish to anyone else that we can see. Instead, she went and she gave it to God. And this difficulty created in her much of the character, I believe, that we see. Now, I would love if we could get character any other way. I would love if our faith could be increased any other way. I would love if we could go to GNC, God's Nutrition Center, and if we could get character on the shelf. I would buy that supplement. How about you? I would spend 70, 80, 90, maybe even 100 bucks a month for character. I I would spend 150 bucks for faith. I would probably spend a lot more than that for faith if I could take a daily pill. But the reality is God doesn't choose to give us character and faith by a supplement. He doesn't choose to give it to us just automatically. The reality is look at every character in the Bible, all the stories in the Bible and people in the Bible. Character and faith grow through adversity. Are you with me? They grow through us being challenged. And what we do with that challenge of life not going our way, every one of us here today can relate to life not going our way. Life has never gone perfectly our way and never will because it's life. And the reality is what we do with the imperfections of life, our own imperfections, the imperfections of our spouse, the imperfections of our children, the imperfections of our job, the imperfections of our church, the imperfections of you name it, what we do with that imperfection shapes the character and the faith that we have because what we do is hopefully we do what Hannah did, this woman of grace, and we turn to God. We turn to him not just once, but we turn to him over and over and over Because, folks, I want you to know that the character of God is such that he wants us to turn to him. In your difficulty, he wants you to come to him. What parent today wouldn't want your child to come to you in their pain and difficulty? I've got three of them, and I want every time I want to be there for them. Now, they probably won't always do that, but I always say, we are here for you. In fact, I love Psalm 34, verse 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Look at those words. The Lord is close and the Lord saves the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in the spirit. Jesus said, come to me all you who are weary and and just overloaded and I will give you rest. We need to learn the habit of turning to the Lord, not turning to others, not turning to a bottle, not turning to a pill, not turning to an addiction, not turning even always to the same person or people thinking they have the answers for our lives. We can find those in a small way, but the truth is, as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to turn to the Lord. Are you with me this morning? We need to learn the habit of trusting that though we don't see how God's going to figure it out, I believe that God's got my life in his hands and I'll turn to him. Well, what if he doesn't give me the answer right away? That's okay, I'm going to keep turning. I'm going to keep trusting because I believe God is a good God and I can turn and give my life, my problems, my imperfections to a God who is perfect and knows how he wants to work things out for my good and his glory. Yeah, amen. That is the truth. And that is what Hannah did. Look at verse 12. As she kept on praying to the Lord. (laughs) So her faith and devotion are are so strong. They've been so developed. Her character is so, so developed that they rise above even the misunderstanding and the criticism of the nation's highest spiritual leader. Look at how she rises above. As she kept on praying to the Lord Eli... who's supposed to be the high priest, so to speak, Eli observed her mouth as she was praying. And so Hannah was praying in her heart the words, and her lips were moving, it says, but her voice wasn't heard. She wasn't speaking aloud. And so you can think she was there. That's my rendition. I, I believe that's, That's what it would have looked like to a certain degree. And as Eli saw her, it says Eli thought she was 
She was drunk, he thought. And he said to her, how long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. And look at what Hannah, how she replies. She's already got a rival in her home. She's already got somebody who continually derides her and berates her and belittles her and provokes her and irritates her. And so what does she do? I got to get out of the house. I got to go to the house of God. I got to pour out my heart to God. And so I'm going to pour out my heart. And not only does she have a rival in the home, but now she has a rival at the temple or at the tabernacle. The the very one who's supposed to be the, the spiritual leader with no discernment, he looks and he says, hey, you lush, well, put away your wine. And you know what? She responds with as much grace as she responds to Penina. She responds to Eli. And we'll learn about Eli. <laughs> but she says, not so, my Lord. Uh-uh. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I haven't been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Don't take your servant for a wicked woman. I, I, I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And she said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshiped before the Lord. And then went back to their home at Ramah, Elkanah, Penina, her whole family, and Hannah. And it says, Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah, her womb was open, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. And she named him, for the book, Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. And when the man Elkanah went up with his family to offer the annual sacrifice, every year they would go up to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah didn't go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I'll take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband told her. Stay here until you've weaned him, only may the Lord make good his word. So it says the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Read that, about three years old, and after he was weaned, she took the boy with, uh, okay, never, but that is what it was, and after he was weaned, she took the boy with her. Young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Picture it. She finally, after three years, she takes her little boy. She takes Samuel, and she says, we're going to go to the temple. We're going to go to the tabernacle. And we've got all these sacrifices. And hand in hand, she brings him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. And when they had slaughtered the bull, verse 25, they brought the boy to Eli. And she said to him, as surely as you live, may the Lord... I am, or surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. Do you remember me? <laughs> I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Do you remember what she said in her prayer? She said, I'm your servant, and if you give me a child, I will sacrifice him to you. I won't sacrifice him, but I will give him to you. And that's something that happened. People would take that firstborn and they would offer them as someone that could serve in the tabernacle or serve in the temple. And you know what? You stop and you say, well, why did it take so long? If God was going to do this, why did he allow her to go through all of that trouble? Well, so that she could develop the faith and the graciousness and the character that she could develop. But also, as we'll see, because it wasn't God's time for her to have Samuel, because if she would have had him sooner, then as you're going to find out, it wouldn't have gone the same in the Lord's house with Eli and his two sons, Trick and Frack, right? Hophni and Phinehas. These guys are reprobates, as you'll find out next week. So God had a purpose in his timing. He always does. Are you with me? I don't like God's timing often. I get mad at the timing of God. I'm like, why? But the reality is I've learned, even when I don't like God's timing, I'm learning and have learned that God knows best. That God may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. Anyone say amen to that? He's always right on time. He's sovereign and sees things we don't. 
This woman learned to turn to God, not just once, but over and over. She saw God answer her prayers, and she gave the praise report. I love it. She goes back to the priest, Eli, and she says, hey, remember me? I prayed for the son. Here he is. He's yours. Take care of him. Now, if you bring a kid to me, bring a year's supply of diapers and a nanny and a wet nurse, please. Okay? Imagine, that's what it would have been. There's the tabernacle, there's the priest, you go live with him. We'll see how it all pans out. It's foreign to us today. But the reality is, folks, God knew what he was doing all along, and she gives God all the praise. May we learn to trust God just a little bit like this with our difficulties. May we learn to seek God just a little bit more like this with our struggles and our challenges. May we learn what it means like she to pour out our heart no matter what those around us are saying. To trust in God no matter what kind of rivals we have in our lives. No matter what kind of enemies or frenemies that we have in our life. No matter what kind of people that we would learn to find our security, to find our strength, to find our hope not in what we're going through and not in our ability to solve it, but in a God who's got it all under control. God is seated on the throne right now, and nothing we're going through has taken him by surprise, and God has seen how he wants to work those things out for our good and his glory, and I'm going to keep preaching that. Amen? Lord, we're thankful.